You do. But this week is a special week because we have it's really shaken. It's really shaken. We have such a special guest. We are not going to delay in getting to him. We have with us the author of the book, Who Are We Now? Blaze Aguera y Arcas, who is the CTO of Tech and Society at Google, joining us to talk about his book, about AI, about gender and sexuality, and how it all intersects. Blaze, welcome to the show. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me on. Thank you. We are very excited to talk to you, Blaze. I think that this show could be three hours long because this book is so fascinating. So Absolutely. we will try not to keep you here for three hours. But um, before we get into the millions of questions we have for you, we like to play a little game to fill each other in on our week, which is cringe or delight, something embarrassing or something delightful that happened to you this week, um, just so we can catch up. So we'll let you chat with us and listen to ours, and then we'll have you go last. Does that sound good? All right, cool. Bean, what do you yes. have? Cringe? Delight? I have a delight. It's not really related okay. to me. It's just something I experienced and I thought it was really lovely to experience it in person. My mother is currently undergoing radiation and we were at the hospital on one of the days this week and somebody there rang the bell, which I know symbolizes the end of their final treatment and they are done with their Aww. cancer treatment. And I've never, I've seen videos and it's, it's always lovely to watch, but seeing it in person, I mean, I had goosebumps head to toe. All the nurses Aww. were out in the hallway. They rang it. Everyone was clapping. I didn't even see the human and I was still crying. It just felt Aww. really powerful in the moment to experience that live. That's really beautiful. Wow. <laughs> Thanks so for sharing. Weird that. and cringy. I know. Now I'm embarrassed to talk about my week because like it's ridiculous. <laughs> yeah, literally, it's that dumb. Um, that is really beautiful. And it you know what? Beautiful. There is something about being there in that shared space of energy yes. when that's happening versus hearing about it. So I can feel like the energy that you feel in that moment with that person there. That's really I, I even have goosebumps just uh, discussing it again. I love it. All right. Well, I'll get into yeah. my cringe. Yeah. So as you know, Bean, Blaze, you don't know this because we just met. I have started working out early in the mornings. I do not wake up early, but my neighbors and good friends pick me up on their way and they take me in the workout classes on the beach. So what's to hate you. about it? Right. Yeah. So anyway, it's this like weight class, weightlifting with kettlebells. And I am this noob among these women who have been doing it. So all of the exercises she teaches, she keeps having to stop and be like, but Maury, you do this with the two pound weight, but Maury, you do this with no weight. And last week, or was it Wednesday, they were doing a bunch of like really hard stuff. And I was just laying there with no weights, trying to even figure out how, like some of these exercises, my brain can't understand the movements of. That's it's, how I feel like is going to happen today when we just chat with Blaze and his yeah. <laughs> utmost intelligence. I feel like my body and brain are just not going to compute properly. This is the most yes. intimidated I have been on our podcast yet, Blaze. I'd like oh, you to no. know. Oh, no. Come on. <laughs> That's true. It's so amazing. It's, it, yeah. I was like, what will I share? He already knows everything. <laughs> it's true. So I will far, attest so to that. <laughs> that's, um, that's incredibly, incredibly kind of you to say. <laughs> it's the truth. <laughs> Well, Ask before we get me. into yeah. it, Blaze, yes. tell us about your week. Anything delightful or embarrassing that happened to you? Well, I, I guess it's, a, I mean, it's a little Pollyanna, but the first thing that comes to mind is that um, our younger kiddo uh, got into uh, their first uh, college. Uh, and, um, <gasps> oh, you know, congratulations! That, Pollyanna, yeah. that's exciting. Yeah, it was, it, it, it felt like kind of a big deal. Um, Absolutely. And, uh, you know, that's, yeah, so that, that, that was mine. That's, That's lovely. Are they applying to multiples and do they have a dream school that they're hoping for? Yeah. I mean, everybody, yeah. everybody, you know, nowadays seems to apply yeah. to hundreds. Yeah. So uh, yeah, there, there are a lot. Um, but, um, you know, this, this kid is, is, uh, <laughs> is looking for a place that, that teaches, you know, Sumerian and Hittite and Akkadian and whatnot. And, you know, wow. so this, you know, kind of very esoteric stuff and so wow. there are a handful of places that uh that, that do that and they got into into <gasps> places with a really 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 good program along those lines wow. so. oh my god i mean no surprise but your I kid can't... also sounds fascinating exactly, exactly. that's exactly i do have I to say about. the joke on this podcast is that i'm such a history nerd but sumerian history is so fascinating to me it's pretty out to lunch isn't it it is and i love the fact that they're gonna they want to focus on it yeah 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 
All right. Well, Blaze, without further ado, let's talk about this incredible book. So as I said up top, you've written this book, Who Are We Now? Um, And it is this incredible book about the intersection of AI, of identity, of gender, of sexuality. I would love to start talking um, and hearing from you about why this book? Why this intersection? Uh, it's you know you you talk about in this book how this is a result of around four years of survey research that you did with people around identity. How did you get to the space of of gender and sexuality, and why is this book so important to you right now? Yeah, it's a great it's a great first question to ask, um, and and not an easy one because it's a project yeah. that you know I, I kind of fell into it for various reasons, um, and my reasons for doing it evolved. Uh, as it went along. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, and it's been about, you know, at least a six year project. I began in 2016. So um, I I guess um, if I really zoom out, the reason that I ended up spending so much time doing this project is because I feel like we're in the middle of a really big transition as a species and as a planet. Um, From a planetary point of view, you know, we're at this moment when human activities are um, having an effect on on the planet at planetary scale. Uh, you know, people sometimes call that the Anthropocene. It's like a you know, an actual geological epoch in which suddenly human activity is sort of the dominant factor in 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 the planet's fate. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, well, sadly, and dot dot dot. I mean, I think it's complicated. <laughs> you know, absolutely. Uh, I mean, I'm 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 as worried about 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 climate collapse as anybody. But but I think it's I think it's more than just a story of you know I don't know of, of the human rape of nature or something we're we're part of nature, and mm-hmm. and that's also that's also part of the book's story the sense that symbiosis is kind of the driving force that um, that has led all of the big changes in, in in life on Earth that is to say you know living things uh, working together to create uh, something greater than than themselves. Mm. Um, and uh, and that also feels like something that is happening right now in the context of AI. So um, you know, AI is also a, a big, uh, you know, I believe a big evolutionary transition for us. Absolutely. And um, and, and I guess and I guess finally, uh, you know, and to connect it a little bit more with the with the gender and sexuality piece, um, you know, there, there's also been a ten thousand year trend of humans basically pushing up against the limits of reproduction, like every other species on earth, trying to just grow uh, as fast as possible and being held in check by, um, by Darwinian forces, you know, by, by disease and, and starvation. And, um, and as we've developed all of these technologies and, and lifted those constraints, our numbers, you know, really exploded. Right. Uh, but now in this century, we're poised to, you know, for our numbers to actually start going down uh, for the first time, due to choice rather than due to constraint. Uh, Mm -hmm. And that also feels like part of that same big transition. So that's the way in which I feel like, you know, the the, the planetary transitions and the gender and sexuality transitions are actually connected. Wow. Fascinating connections. And you know, what I would love to do is try to take our listeners through this beautiful arc you do in the book of discussing identity. Uh, And you talk about in this book how, you know, human identity and the othering that is accompanying our attempts to distinguish us versus them is really prevalent right now, particularly in our politics. Uh, But you really do a fabulous job of narrowing that down historically and even to our own systems as human beings. And I was really particularly struck by your idea of American family systems, or not your idea, your discussion of American family systems um, and how they're based on a nuclear family. Right. Um, And what I thought was so interesting as someone who works with people on speaking their truth um, and and living their truth and being individuals is you talk about how this nuclear system really comes at a cross current to individualism. Can you just say a little bit more about that for our listeners? Can you fill them in about that kind of um, intersection? Sure. Um, Well, uh, nuclear families, I mean, everybody kind of assumes that they're they're sort of a default. They're the way things work. Uh, you know, I, I, I talk a little bit in the book about like the old Hanna-Barbera cartoons, the, the Flintstones, mm-hmm, the Jetsons. Uh, you know, it, it was funny because like, I mean, I certainly grew up with that. I grew up with them in, in, in uh, I, I saw them dubbed into Spanish and in, in, in Mexico and stuff. And, <laughs> and um, 
the the kind of joke or the premise of that was like yeah technology changes you know stone age space age but you know the family is the is the invariant thing like that's just always been it's right. always been the same right uh, and and nothing could be further from the truth um you know the um i mean and this was a bit of a surprise for me also doing the research for this book um a lot of our ideas about nuclear families uh, are actually pretty new uh you know many of them uh, arise in the victorian period um and uh, and the story of how they are, how they arose is you know, is complicated. It, it has partly to do with Christianity uh, and with um, uh, property laws and inheritance, um, right. and with uh, and with the, the decline of clan structures, which were much more uh, sort of collectivist. But um, uh, and 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 it's had a lot of consequences. Uh, you know, some of which some of which have been um, really important in the history of urbanization and technology and so on. But uh, but all of that feels like it's changing now. Uh, and, right. Um, right. I mean, there, there have been a lot of articles in the news about like the falling apart of the nuclear family and all these new relationship models that are springing up. The fact that so many fewer people in the city, especially, are uh, are getting married uh, right. and are having kids. So, right. uh, you know, so talking about the nuclear family as sort of something bounded in time that both, you know, came at a certain moment, we still assume is normal, but that is now possibly, uh, you know, on the decline. Yeah, is, is one of the themes. Yeah, absolutely. And I thought it was so interesting how you laid that across also the line of gen of uh, generational, you know, changes, what's happening with Gen Z versus um, older generations and also urban and rural in the serve. Can you talk a little bit actually about the surveys you did um, over those four years and how they uh, enlightened you around where we're moving around identity? Yeah, of course. Um, so it's, um, as you say, four years or I, actually about six years of surveys, but there were four okay. years when I ran kind of the same one repeatedly so that I could, you know, look at changes over time, uh, as, as well as within a cohort. Um, and there, the book is basically divided into three parts. Uh, and, uh, and, and the reason was that I wanted to have sort of like a practice run in, in talking about what identity is all about and how it works. And the practice run, I w was about handedness. Uh, just left-handedness, mm -hmm. right-handedness. So I never. It was. It was. It was interesting to me too. Yeah. I wasn't expecting it to be interesting, so I, I never. I never thought that that I, you know, actually uh, published that part. But there were so many surprises in it that I thought, you know, this this is worth this is worth putting in the book too. Uh, you know, both to introduce the methods and to start talking about how identity works in a way that's a little bit less fraught, you know, than gender and sexuality, which is obviously a mm -hmm. huge hot button topic. Right. Um, but anyway, I found I, that um, would be really relatable. I thought to the left-handedness, it's it's way less yeah. abstract. I think to people, it's very it's a little more concrete to understand. Totally, and and everybody understands that with handedness, you know, there are behaviors like you know which hand totally. you use with the scissors, uh, or that you write with. There's an identity. You know, do you say I'm a left-handed person? I'm a right-handed person? And there's there's some biology involved, right? There there's something about brain lateralization that's involved there too. So it's kind of uncontroversial that way, and and it lets you know it lets one have a conversation about the relationships between those kinds of variables without um, uh, without too much anxiety about misstepping. Mm -hmm. Yeah, beautiful. So you started with that, and then tell us how the surveys evolved over time, and. Um, you know, you're collecting this information. Are you thinking about a hypothesis? Are you thinking about an end game here? What, what's happening as you're collecting the data and, and what's starting to come out around how we're looking at identity right now in our culture? Yeah, uh, great question. I, I didn't begin with a strong hypothesis. A lot of this was, was curiosity driven. So, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm kind of a data scientist, I guess, at heart. And, um, and I didn't begin with, with any, any, really strongly held ideas about what I would find, I just realized there was a lot that I didn't know. And, and, I, and I began to analyze the data in order to, to discover more about how mm -hmm. those variables relate of, of, of uh, identity and biology and so on. So um, the questions always, always included, how old are you? Uh, and they also always included zip code. And mm. this was pretty interesting because um, you know, there there are a lot of graphs in the book, as as you've as you've seen. Yes, <laughs> like um, you know, well over a hundred, which is unusual for you know for um for a book, and why I had some trouble finding a publisher actually. Um, <laughs> are you a numbers but, guy though? I'd imagine you're a numbers guy. You're a data guy, right? Yeah, I am. I so am. You needed I mean, some graphs. I don't blame you. I actually found I found, and I'm not a math person. Like I math 
intimidated me my whole life. But I found your graphs so helpful to the context of what I was reading because it did really do a good job clarifying exactly what you were describing in the data. So I think the the graphs in this book are very complementary to the story you're telling because you're it's a narrative book, which is fascinating because it's a, it's also about data. But I, I thought that they really helped bring them home. But anyway, we cut you off. Continue. No, I'm Sorry. so glad. I'm so glad to hear you say that because yeah. uh, you know I I am also a stories person personally. Yes, I, you know, I like yes, clearly both narrative and data. And um, and the point of putting in the data for me was not to make it a nerdy book, but to kind of show rather than tell a bunch of the you know especially more more controversial or more interesting points in the book to to just you know show why it right. is that that you know that, that I'm drawing some of the conclusions that I that I am and, and to allow the reader to draw their own conclusions too. Yes, right. And I think that you talk a lot about how obviously our identity politics are dividing us. So I do think that when you just go to the data, you know. What is there to argue? But these are the responses, and here's how they're plotted. Exactly, exactly. We yeah. can always we can always discuss interpretations, and you know sometimes there are different interpretations. But the data are the data, and it's good it's good to try and ground ourselves in that as well as we can. Yeah, um, totally. But um, let's talk about some of the results, uh, particularly as it comes to gender and sexuality and identity. Um, you found some really interesting things about um, you know what is happening with younger respondents versus older respondents. Can you give us a sense of, you know, what are you seeing are the trends? What, what did the data show you around gender and sexuality um, is happening as we are going forward into the future? Yeah. Yeah. So the, the reason, the reason I, brought up the, I brought up the graphs is because uh, the majority of them plot responses either as a function of age or as a function of population density. Right. Um, and, you know, the population density, you can compute from the zip code because the Census Bureau has like, you know, the area of every zip code as well as how many people live in it. So you divide the one by the other, you get density. Yeah. Um, and, and the reason for that is that is that those patterns, changes by age and changes by density, were overwhelmingly, the, you know, seemed like the most important patterns in the data. And, and what they show is that, uh, you know, first of all, uh, younger people have a lot more... Um, identification with uh, with minority identities of all kinds than older people mm -hmm. do. More queer people, more bi people, um, more non-monogamous people, and so on and so forth. So, um, you know, kind of no matter what uh, identity you can think of, with actually one interesting exception, which is intersexuality, but mm -hmm. pretty much everything else, you know, it's really high among the young and declines a lot uh, among the older population. Uh, so something is definitely changing, you know. Do you uh, have for, a theory as to what is changing? Yeah, I I, I do, um, and um, you know, I, I guess the um, the simplest way to talk about it is that is that identity goes along with culture, and the more community people find, which historically has been driven by move, the movement into cities, um, the more they find communities of affinity or communities of interest, and um, and, and that also explains why you see the same pattern in density. So uh, when you look at, at people in cities, they also are much more associated with, uh, you know, with, with identity. It's almost like, you know, being young and being in a city go together. Even if you're older and you're in the city, you're more like a younger person in that sense. You're, you're, uh, there, are, there are more identities. Uh, there are more minorities. And the, and the more you look in, in the countryside, actually the older people get, but also the more homogenous they get. Um, and, and, the, and the less identity plays a role in things. Um, and what mm -hmm. I mean by the less identity plays a role in things is like, take bisexuality as an example. Um, if you are, um, if you're in the countryside and you say, I'm bisexual, then the likelihood is that that describes what you're doing. Uh, in other words, I am right now actually, you know, having relationships with, with people of both sexes. Whereas in the city, people will identify as bisexual, even if they are, say, you know, married to somebody of the opposite sex and have been for a long time and are not acting on it. So the, the identity aspect of things becomes more important than the behavioral one, the, the more, the more um, you are in a community of, of, uh, of other like-minded people. Wow. So now that has me thinking, so let's talk about this us versus them. Yeah. So when you plot that against the us versus them that's going on, and actually, could you do our listeners a favor and define like you do in the book, what, what us versus them means sure. right now, you think, in our country? 
Uh, well, it's it's I mean polarization, which is the you know the story of what's happening in our in our politics, uh, you know, of course, and 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 also what's happening with the culture wars, the the way um, the way everybody is kind of setting up uh, political battle lines based on identity. Um, you know, it, it, I think that if we go back a few decades uh, in American history, um, you know, people used to have a variety of different opinions about you know about various policies or uh, you know or various beliefs, but it wasn't quite so lined up. You know, where you mm -hmm. had to sort of have the party line on everything, depending on how you identified. Um, right. And 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 that that sort of, um, uh, I guess, you know, uh, privileging of identity over. Uh, over any specific issues or over the, you know, the ability to sort of think things through uh, strikes me as a, as a pretty dangerous trend. Um, and, and, and the more you other, uh, uh, you know, some group of people who you know, you've decided or not, you know, don't believe the right things, you know, are, are other, the more you dehumanize them. Uh, and, and mm -hmm. I, I see that, you know, personally, I see that happening on both, uh, the right and on the left, uh, and, and it's right. worrisome. Absolutely. Making this 2024 election feel very yeah. overwhelming for sure agreed agreed um so when we think about gender and sexuality then in rural areas there's this map in here that i thought was really cool that has an overlay that shows you you know democrat versus republican voting areas and you know you're obviously seeing those blue clusters in the urban areas and then you know jarringly the majority of the country is red because of you know the middle part what happens to identity if you identify as lgbtq plus in those rural areas um what are you seeing are we trending towards something else is is that going to change that you know political map in any way how are you seeing rural areas change as more and more younger people are identifying as lgbtq plus yeah uh, it's a, it's a, it's a great question and in a way the most important question in the book i think because mm -hmm. um you know the the big mega trend of the last ten thousand years is people concentrating into cities and and the countryside emptying out um but it doesn't empty out in a uniform way uh if you are um gay and you grow up in the countryside you're almost certainly going to move to the city because that's mm -hmm. where that's where you will find your people and, mm -hmm. uh, and and the problem is that then that results in an increasingly homogenous countryside. So not only is the countryside becoming more yeah. sparsely populated, but it's also becoming a lot more uniform. Um, and when when you look at, at things like you know voting patterns, you know do you, do you plan to vote for Trump or or for Biden? Actually, I haven't um, I haven't run the survey this year. I'm I'm almost a little bit afraid to. But I but I did run it for the 2016 and 2020 elections, and there is no other variable that correlates as sharply with that as density. You know, if you're in the countryside, wow. you're going to vote Republican. If you're in the city, you're going to, you're going to vote Democrat. And, wow. um, and, 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 and I, you know, I asked a bunch of sort of more specific questions about beliefs. Like, do you believe homosexuality is morally wrong? Nobody in the city believes that homosexuality is morally wrong. A lot of people in the countryside do. Um, right. and yet there are, there are, you know, very few out gay people in the countryside. Um, right. if you ask, um, you know, do you, do you, uh, are you afraid, um, uh, are you concerned about Sharia law being imposed in the U.S.? Um, nobody in the city is concerned about Sharia law being imposed in the U.S. The, the percentage in the countryside is really high. It's up around like half, despite the yeah. fact that there, there are virtually no Muslims uh, in the countryside in the U.S. So, you know, what, what's so interesting is that the fear of the other mm -hmm. uh, grows in the absence of the other. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. and uh, um, and the reason that this is such a uh, is such a dangerous mix with the way politics works in in the U.S. is that uh, political power is partly a function of of land area. You know that's that's why we have like a, you know two Senate seats per per state. It doesn't matter how populous the state is, or right. why you know we have these congressional districts, right? That even if they're very sparsely populated, they still you know they still get congressional seats, um, and. Um, and so as the countryside empties out, you know, the very small numbers of very homogenous people left there have uh, have really disproportionate political power. And that's why we've seen the popular vote and uh, and the, um, you know, and the and the official vote diverge uh, in, in recent election cycles. Yeah. Wow. I was going to ask you say in the beginning of the book that you were on a podcast in 2016 where they were sure Hillary, Hillary was going to win and you were like, no. 
the data is showing opposite. So I was afraid to ask you that question too. I'm glad you haven't looked into it. I don't want to know yeah. the answer. I haven't. I, I haven't. Want, I haven't. I want to it. know. I need to emotionally prepare. Yeah, I haven't. But I actually that, live in. I live in the myself. countryside. Countryside, and I actually live in an area where it's very split, <laughs> which feels strangely very overwhelming. I bet. You know, we're talking about the othering, um, and and in the book you talk about nationalism, racism, classism, really articulate articulately, um, and you talk about how they play a part in the othering of LGBTQ plus people. Can you speak to this, to this idea of nationalism, classism, racism, and how they play into othering um, based on sexuality? Um, well. Uh, so there are a lot of different axes for identity. Uh, mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it, it turns out that, um, you know, as, as I mentioned earlier, like people tend to line up on, on, uh, on one side or another of, of you know, the, 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 more, the more we polarize, um, the more everything sort of starts to, um, starts to pull apart. Yeah. Um, I, the, the, the pattern that I have seen uh, within the U.S., and, and the, my data are, are really, you know, all... U.S. data because you know it was easier to survey there, and I, I speak the language well, and I understand more of the more of the cultural nuances. I didn't feel equipped to do that internationally, so you know it'd be really interesting to repeat some of these surveys internationally too. But but the pattern that I saw was that um, American nationalism is much much stronger in the countryside where the population is more homogenous. Right. Um, the cities are where immigrants come. Uh, you know, so yeah. if you if you immigrate to the U.S., you will almost certainly. Uh, you know, end up in a, in a city and not in the countryside. And so, you know, diversity, just like with LGBTQ kind of stuff, right? Uh, uh, diversity of languages and of cultures is also uh, high in the cities and low in the countryside. Um, even, uh, even the black population, which of course, you know, has been in the U.S. for a lot longer than most of the white population, um, mm -hmm. you know, has, has been driven out systematically from the countryside. One, one of the real shocks for me was, was uh, reading about how the USDA's um, farming policies and you know sort of um, uh, uh, lending policies for uh, for rural farmers has right. caused uh, like a huge uh, majority of of um, black farmers in the countryside to lose their land over the last century. So it's become right. completely white. Um, wow. Yeah. Uh, so so yeah. I you know ironically you know nationalism is high um, in in the places where. Um, where the American population is actually not representative of, you know, of, of who Americans actually are nowadays, but maybe with some imagined past, you know, from the 1950s or 1960s. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's also interrelated. Blaze, I, and I tell me if this isn't correlated. I was really, I loved this connection you made and, and you talked about this book, uh, Philosophy of Marriage by Michael Ryan, that was written in the 1800s, as you talk about monogamy and you say um, basically, monogamy, monogamy must be enforced so that capitalism and patriarchy can be preserved. Um, tell us about that. And tell us about, right? Tell us about that. I just, I underlined it because I was like, yep, truth. You know when you feel truth from like the top of your head to your toes? <laughs> so tell us about that. And tell us if that monogamy being one part that has to be enforced for capitalism and patriarchy to, to persevere but also then um, identity around gender and sexuality has to fit in to this nuclear marriage model of heteronormativity, I'm assuming. So can you talk a little bit about that? Can I interject sure. quickly? And only if you're comfortable speaking to this, I'm just curious what your um, personal situation is. Are you in a nuclear family setup? I'm just curious how you gained all of this perspective. Yeah, uh, I mean, my own situation is pretty conventional. Uh, you know, I this I'm, I'm definitely not writing this writing this book as as an advocate or uh, you know kind of putting myself in the picture. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I, you I'm truly married. Curious. We have like we have two kids. Yeah. You know, it's like you're you know, the, you're the yeah, picturesque totally, American family. Exactly, yeah. totally Flintstones, Jetsons. So yeah. <laughs> so I'm 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 um I'm not I'm not you know so much you know writing my truth as as I am <laughs> uh, you know being gay. Uh, you know, a curious and open-minded um, data scientist and questioner, and and just you, you know um, talking about what I'm what I'm observing, what I'm seeing, uh, without without trying to bring my own uh, prejudices uh, into the picture. 
Um, but thanks and, for and asking. And that perspective. I think that's a really fascinating, completely objective perspective on something that's critically important, particularly right now. Well, I mean, I mean, I do, I do want to, I do want to also like be careful here. I, I don't think that there is, there is such a thing as a completely objective perspective. And, Agreed. You know, where, Fully where I, where I do have opinions that I'm bringing into the picture, I, you know, I, I try and, I try and make those explicit as well. I don't, I don't want to, you know, uh, I don't want to be sort of. Um, uh, secretive about about those but uh, but i also think that it's important to be able to um do data analysis and write and analyze about things other than oneself absolutely and I think you I... remain neutral and i think the data speaks for itself as well thank you i think that comes from a neutral perspective thank you that was definitely the goal yes okay so to the question then about monogamy yes. and uh and 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 the necessity of monogamy and monogamous marriages for capitalism to um, tell us how, tell us more about that, but tell us, as I was saying, how does, how does gender identity and sexuality also play into the, the pervasive culture being that in a capitalistic society where we live in a patriarchy, those things kind of work counter to, to the success of that system. Yeah. Can you explain that? I, I can try. Uh, it's, yeah. This is a this is a, a you know a, a long and complicated story, but um, you know, um, in in the old days, I mean, we we don't we don't really know what human society was like, um, you know, pre in in prehistory. I mean, there there is we have archaeological evidence, obviously. We, um, you know, there there are some uh, some historians, archaeologists who argue that we used to have something more like a matriarchy. Uh, there are some, you know, perhaps in, in the, uh, you know, in the old hunter gatherer days. Um, I, I think the real answer is probably that it's complicated. Uh, there were there were a lot of different kinds of human societies, um, you know, if we go way back in time. And when I say way back in time, I mean we've got to keep in mind, like humans have been around for hundreds of thousands of years, right. and you know, all of our recorded history is basically just about the period since the dawn of agriculture, you know, the last ten thousand right. or so. So there is just, you know, a huge blank area uh, where I think a lot of people kind of project their own, you know, politics and their own wishes. Um, yes. But, but I'm, I'm, I'm kind of with, with uh, you know, David Graeber and David Wengro in their, in their book, The Dawn of Everything, on mm -hmm. the idea that there was probably just a, a really wide variety of systems. Um, mm -hmm. And if we look at our, at our, our closest um, primate relatives, which, you know, might be a useful clue, they are the chimps and the bonobos. And... You know, it's a little bit too cartoonish to say like the chimps are, are, patri are patriarchs and the bonobos are matriarchs, but you know that's not a hundred percent wrong, right? We've kind of okay. got, we've got both in the mix, um, you know, in terms of our our, our biological inheritance. Okay, um, but um, with farming, uh, I think what does start to become clear is that uh, when we settle and when we farm, uh, you know, that's when when property starts to become really important because you know now you you own your farm and um, and you own uh, if you like the um, the reproduction of all of the crops on that farm right. and of your livestock and so on, and there is um, there are very strong indications that when that begins happening, uh, men start to think about their women as their property as well, uh, right. and you know frankly in just the same way that they think about their livestock. Um, right. I mean, it, that, that's a brutal thing to say, but um, you know I, it's I think it's accurate. Yeah. yeah, I actually Blaze, I was um, just reading something about the word rape and how the word rape meant theft, right. um, you know, in the 1800s Carry, even. Carry away. Yeah. Yeah. And that then, so then rape means that you're t taking something that's mine and making it impure. That's yes. how it was applied to women. Wow. Yes. So yes. to the point of what you're saying. Yeah. Pretty, pretty dark, right? Very dark. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> so as we get, you know, into our current reality around capitalism, you know, how do you see our identity politics playing into, um, or how is capitalism affecting our identity politics today? Well, one one of the um, one of the consequences of the idea that you know that the, the man owns reproduction and you know the woman is the is the means for reproducing, it, it also goes along with the fact that children are property too. Right. Um, you know, and um, and the 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 likely reason that we've seen birth rates plummet so much in advanced economies, uh, and, and this is, you know, really worth dwelling on, by the way, like the, you know, the total fertility rate, which is to say the, um, the average number of children per woman, um, you know, in, in the poorest country on earth today, which is uh, Niger, is about seven. 
um, and that was below wow. the uh, the world average, uh, you know, in in, in uh, 1900. Wow. So uh, you know, when you you look at, at number of of, of 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 children per woman and and wealth, the two correlate perfectly. And and the reason is because um, back in the old days when agriculture was the was the way we all made a living and, and the way we subsisted, children were valuable as workers. Right. Right. Like, like the point of having of having kids was that they were going to they were going to farm, they were going to generate more wealth and they were going to support you in your old age. Mm -hmm. So um, so, you know, you you reproduced because that was economically positive. We just um, commented on this the other day when one of my kids didn't want to do the dishes or something. And we were like, at your age, you'd be married off with children exactly. working on the farm. You could do the dishes. Yeah, I've tried to I've tried to pull that with. with, with it my didn't kids work. Well. Doesn't work. No, it yeah. doesn't work. Ineffective. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, and I mean, as you know, uh, you know, and, and like we're we're now looking at you know sending our second to to college. Like, kids are no longer economically positive. The opposite. No. <laughs> quite the opposite it's the opposite and um you know and, and and there are many you know there are many reasons that we can talk about you know vis-a-vis -vis choice obviously you know women starting to have a lot more of a say in what happens with their own reproduction is important but um but i think that the the, the root uh change that has happened is is that very simple one of just you know they were a economic good and now they're an economic cost uh so from that perspective, you know, like what the point is, what is the, um, you know, when we think about what it means to uh, amass wealth or to be productive or, or, uh, or to propagate, like all of that starts to become more a question of ideas and of culture and of, uh, of other more abstract things versus just, you know, literally how many, how many children, how many acres of land right. and so on. Wow. Yeah. Fascinating. Um, Okay, I want to talk, I want to ask you another question about gender. And then I want to start talking about AI, because you have a very oh my gosh. interesting perspective on the word we, which I want to get to. Um, you know, I, I work a lot with um, non binary and trans uh, people. Um, as a coach, they've become some of my closest friends, I've been so uh, proud of the steps they're taking to um, speak for a deeply underrepresented and vilified group um, of people um, in the face of a lot of violence in this country and in other countries. And one of the things that we talk a lot about is this idea of gender being a social construct. And I, and I see it come up in your book as well. I wanted to ask you about gender as a social construct over time. Um, you know, it, it shows in the clothes we buy for our children, blue or pink. Um, talk a little bit about how, when I say gender is a social construct, can you break that down for our listeners? Because I think sometimes you hear that and you think, what do you mean? It's biology. Is it? And, and, and why? Why is it? Why isn't it? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's a great question. And, <clears throat> and it's one that, it's one that um, I've, always, I've always been a little bit worried about answering you know, in, in, in public settings and podcasts and so on, because it is, it is itself so polarizing. Yes. Uh, and, and I think that, I think that uh, insisting on a binary answer is actually part of the problem. So, uh -huh. you know, in, in a way we have polarized it into like a yes or a no, you know, if you're, right. if you're on the left, you're supposed to say it's a social construct. Biology is mm -hmm. irrelevant. Uh, mm -hmm. And if you're on the right, you're supposed to say it's biology. It's, it's your, your, are you X, X or X, Y? There's nothing else. The rest is bullshit. And, mm -hmm. um, uh, and, and these two sides, of course, you know, believe that the other is, you know, is, is other is, is awful. Um, the reality I think is, is a lot more complicated than either of those, um, either of those binary assertions. So mm -hmm. on the one hand, um, so many things about the way, um, uh, the way gender is portrayed, you know, on TV, uh, you know, or, or marketed are completely arbitrary. Uh, you know, is it, is it pink or is it blue? I mean, it used to be the other way around. Like this stuff is, you know, is, is, is a total, a total construct. Wait, um, what do you mean it used to be the other way around? Did pink well, used pink, to be a yeah, male pink, color at once? Totally. Oh, really? Yeah. Pink was the robust male color and blue was oh, the, wow. was the, uh, the retiring, uh, feminine color. Totally. I say we so, go yeah, wow. for that. I love that. I know. I say bring all the colors. Bring um, it, right, exactly. Um, so yeah, that, there's, it's you know there's there's a lot of essentialization of gender right. of gender properties that that is just nonsense. Um, on the other hand, uh, you know there there was um, I, I spent a little bit of time in the center of the book talking about 
John Money, the um, the the psychoendocrinologist yes. at Johns Hopkins, who you know is, turns out to have been a bit of a monster, um, yes. but was also like a real darling of second wave feminism for um, for really believing that that um, that gender is is a social construct and actually putting that to the test um, by performing these uh, you know pretty horrendous medical experiments essentially. Um, uh, the, the the most uh, the most famous one, uh, the the Raymer case was uh, a case of of two um, twin. Um, it's a <clears> wild <throat> story. It's a wild story. Wow. Uh, twin baby boys. Uh, they um, uh, they're brought in to be circumcised when they're when they're when they're infants. Um, the circumcision is botched. One of them ends up uh, basically you know losing his penis, and um, uh, and is brought into uh, to John Money's uh, practice. And money's like, don't worry, uh, you know, if, if as long as we construct a vagina and raise and raise him as a girl, it's all going to be fine because gender is socially constructed. And, uh, you know, spoiler, it doesn't go well. <laughs> I was going to say <laughs> yeah. it wasn't fine. It was it not was fine. Not all fine. No, no. So, so, um, uh, you know, there, there was there's obviously stuff, you know, in in the case of uh, in the case of, of of David Raymer that you know made him. Uh, um, that made him male in his in his own self concept uh, that went far beyond uh, you know just sort of like what what his the way his parents socialized him. Uh, right. Having said that, um, you know there there are uh, there is a whole spectrum there of 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 people, including a whole spectrum of flexibility. Um, you know, so one of the one of the more um, uh, one of the one of the weirder I guess you know findings from from this period when when a lot of uh, a lot of uh, sex reassignment or uh, or gender reassignment uh, surgeries were were done on kids uh, who had had their genitals mutilated, which is a surprising number, actually. Like wow. sometimes it seems to have "quote unquote" worked. So it's not like you can say, you know, in a binary way, either yes or no. Mm. Uh, you know, it's biological either. It's complicated, and there's I'm there's curious, sort of an interplay. Mm -hmm. I'm curious what the further rights take is on intersex children and what should be done. I don't know. Did you mention that in your book or do you have a theory on that? The, the rights, the rights question meeting. The rights perspective on how intersexuality, conservative. the conservatives mm. side on what, how intersex children should be raised. Yeah. Um, honestly, I don't know. I, mm. I think that, I think that the, um, you know, one of the things about intersexuality is that because we tend to think about it as a medical condition, like right. diabetes, right, as opposed to an identity, it's it's um, it's hidden. It's a hidden identity, mm -hmm. or if we want to think about it as an identity at all. So, you know, one of the real surprises for me in the survey data was just how common it is. That uh, was and shocking again, to me. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So a bit of a spoiler, but you know, it's likely above two percent. It may be above three uh, percent, which is, is far an astonishing more than number. I ever imagined. Yes. Yeah. Totally. Um, and, and unlike all of the other uh, identities that are very high among the young, the, the pattern by age is really a surprise too. It's basically zero at age 18, uh, the youngest age that I, you know, that, I can, that I can have people answer the survey. And it rises up until, uh, you know, up through the, the 30s. And, and uh, my, my guess as to why that is, is that most people don't know that they're intersex right. until they, you know, go to, the, right. go to the doctor. Maybe it's a fertility problem and they, and they find out. So, um, yeah. and this is a legacy of John Money too, because you know, according to him, you should never tell your kid that they're that they're intersex because that will interfere with their socialization as as one gender or the other. And often the parents weren't told either. So, um, wow. you know, it's you yeah, <laughs> it's My kind goodness. of a shock. And yeah. when people find out, you know, in their in their thirties, I think you know the the most common response is not to you know become an out intersex person or to think about it as an identity, but think about it as a, as a private medical issue that is mm -hmm. not going to, that is not going to get discussed with anybody else. Yeah. And you say in the book, intersex babies born in communities with less access to medical um, facilities are have a very different know. outcome yeah. are less likely to less likely to know uh, less likely right. to get treated. That's right. So, so I think, I think that the, you know, the, the probably the short answer to your question is I, I think that most of the, of the right uh, probably just um, thinks that it's extraordinarily rare even more so right. than the left. And right. so not, not relevant to, you know, to any of these conversations. Yeah. yeah. Well, and so much to say about how important it is uh, that we're having public conversations so that people can 
begin to identify as what is true to them rather than be in this mystery or isolation of an experience that feels like their own. I mean, would you agree that social media and the way that people can own their identity more publicly and that being democratized has changed this trajectory of identity and the way people are responding to surveys like yours? For sure. Um, I mean, as, as, uh, as it becomes more normalized um, to, for example, be intersex, um, it becomes more acceptable for, for people to uh, come out with that and think about it as an identity and, and normalize it. And I mean, I think that's a very positive development in the sense that um, the idea that, 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 that something is, uh, you know, that is, that is a part of your body, that is an aspect of you biologically is somehow a shame or something mm -hmm. to hide, um, you know, seems to me like a, you know, like that would be a problem for your quality of life. Um, sure. So Absolutely. anything that reduces shame is good. Although also obviously people should be free to, uh, you know, to, to keep whatever they want to keep private, private as well. Uh, I'm also right. a big believer in, in privacy. So, you know, it's, I, I yeah. guess it's a matter of choice and, and, and choice is maximized um, if you uh, uh, also, if you don't feel shame. Absolutely. Beautifully said. All right. Well, we can't ignore um, what you do, which is um, you're an expert in machine intelligence and AI. And I think it's time to bring that into the conversation yes. here. Um, so tell us about the correlation you make um, around AI and this us versus them and this we. How does AI fit into that picture? Well, um, Part of the big trend that we've been talking about of just polarization uh, is, you know, I, this wasn't the case when I began writing the book in, 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 you know, in 2016, 2017, but AI has now also become highly polarizing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm, I'm hearing, um, you know, on, on the one hand, uh, AI doomers uh, talk about, about AI as, you know, an other that needs to be, um, uh, stopped before it's going before it leads to human extinction because it's an it's an either or uh, kind of kind of situation. You know, we're gonna, we're, it's going to do to us what we did to the gorillas or something. Um, right. And uh, and I'm and I'm also hearing, uh, you know, I, I mean, I, I guess I would call that sort of the the right or libertarian take, generally speaking. Although you know, this is a generalization. Um, right. And I'm also hearing from the left uh, a lot of a lot of talk about AI being fake. Uh, you know, it's not, it's not real. It's just a capitalist uh, scam. Uh, it's, uh, it's just, a, it's all about labor and exploitation. Uh, and, uh, and it's, um, uh, it's essentially a way for capital to win over labor. Um, you know, and, mm. and, uh, and it's like a whole different set. And, and, and there, you know, questions of justice, uh, right. you know, or take, take precedence, but also there's a denial that, you know, it's, it's sort of, this is all hype, you know, it's, it's, right. it's just corporate hype. Um, Personally, I, I feel like both of those are, um, are, are really problematic extreme positions um, mm. for, for a few reasons. Um, one of them is, you know, when I think about, about symbiosis as being the, the origin of all, uh, of all of the interesting transitions in evolution in the past, you know, everything from like mitochondria, you know, uh, being incorporated into cells to make eukaryotes to, you know, multicellular life and so on. It's all about uh, relationships that are so much more complicated than just competition, you know, of, of A versus right. B. Like life becomes more complicated through things, you know, meshing together, um, mm -hmm. not not through one thing extinguishing another. Uh, you know, our what we've done to the gorillas or the chimpanzees uh, is, is is kind of the exception. Um, you know, <laughs> um, and and we are highly interdependent with uh, with with our technology. The technology can't exist without us, um, mm -hmm, yeah. and you know, increasingly, we can't exist without the technology either. Mm -hmm. um, so as I see it, um, you know, and, and, and you, you know, you, uh, Maura, you mentioned, you know, capitalism, uh, you know, and its problems earlier, like we have a big capitalism problem, uh, in the sense that, you know, if, if as we um, develop technologies that increase our, 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 our aggregate wealth, um, we are not figuring out ways to share those gains. Uh, mm -hmm. That is a huge problem because, uh, you know, both from a, from a humanitarian perspective and right. from a polarization perspective, because we're now, we're now creating, um, uh, you know, we're, we're really exacerbating uh, class divides, which does not go in a, in a good direction. Mm. Um, 
and and I see that as the central problem uh, that that we that we face as we start to you know exist in symbiosis uh, with with AI. But we're displacing a lot of those anxieties, uh, you know, into you know either believing that you know AI is other or that AI is just uh, you know it's just corporations and corporations are other. When I think we need to be having a, a kind of conversation in the middle, if that makes sense. So you're saying, am I hearing you say that you believe the answer is somewhere in the middle, personally, with all of your knowledge? Because I'm not going to lie, I'm a liberal, but I'm a little bit of an AI doomer. Like I'm, what's it? Just feels like it's growing so exponentially that yeah. it's going to, we're going to lose control. Um, but I certainly do not have as much as much knowledge as you do. So it's very refreshing to hear that you believe there is. A middle ground here. Well, I mean, um, control is a complicated word. Like we, you know, we the, the idea that the idea that like we humans are in control, we're on top. It's a hierarchy. Right. Uh, is I think a little bit of an illusion. Um, I mean, I, I talk I talk a bit about um, you know, for instance, our relationship with our crops, you know, with wheat, with with cows. You know, we're like, yeah, we're on top. You know, but. Uh, but there is another way of thinking about it, which is that you know wheat has taken over humanity as its uh, you know as its great propagator. You know, cows have taken have <laughs> taken over. You know, right? Like they, their their numbers have exploded even more than human numbers have exploded. They're you know they're right. They're they're um, you know they're certainly using up more of the land on Earth uh, because because they have manipulated our tastes in some way. Um, you know, or oh. or, a cat, or if you have, if you have a cat at home, like they don't they don't do fuck all. You know, and, right. and right, and they and they get they get they get it all. You know, um, so uh, you know, like who's on top? Uh, you know, the, the way I, the way I see it, it's it's not uh, it doesn't work like you know, um, it's it, not everything is slavery, right? It's not it's right. not a hierarchy like that. It's it is all about symbiosis. So um, so I guess I guess I, I I question even the premise of the question, if that makes sense. Sure, because what what I'm hearing you say is that technology is us. We yeah. are behind it. We are integrated to it. We are now attached to it. So it is, as you said, a symbiotic relationship, meaning that our evolution means that we are integrated with this technology. And you say in the book, you know, what is we? We is also this technology. It is a right. part of the we, that it shouldn't be othered the way that we do to other identities because it's separating us in a way that is not organic. That is how I feel. And, um, you know, and I, I'm very, I'm very, you know, aware here of also being, you know, a Google employee and, you know, like, I, I mean, I want to, I want to be very clear that like, um, the opinions that I'm expressing in the book are not, you know, they're not, they're not sort of like, uh, the, the corporate line, um, right, right. you know, there are, there are a variety <laughs> of things I'm saying that I don't, you know, I, I, I don't want to be associated with, with, with the company there. It's very much my take, sure. but, um, but yeah, for what it's worth, my take is that, um, it's very similar to the take of, of the performance artist Stellark, uh, the Australian performance artist who has said, you know, we, um, technology constructs our humanity just as much as we construct technology. Um, right. you know, when, when we, when we think about why we have such a short gut, uh, you know, and, and, uh, and have such a hard time digesting raw foods, it's because we invented fire and fire has become a part of us. It's like our external mm. digestive system. Wow. You know, and I, and I think AI is, is part of that same tradition, if you like. Beautiful. Well, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, Blaze, we have kept you for so long. I have two <laughs> last questions for you. Um, I seriously could talk to you for three more hours. I mean, I'm truly. Fascinated. I'm fascinated. So yes. fascinated. Yeah. What an incredible body of my work. Lack, my lack of speech. <laughs> Jaw open, no words. That is, um, that is, so, that is so flattering, you too. Thank you so much. <laughs> But really, I mean, an incredible body of work that is um, both data and, as I said, uh, his, it's about our history as a species and about humanity. So to that point, um, two-part question, what is your biggest warning for us as humanity? Oh, and wow. what is your greatest hope, given what you see from your vantage point? Yeah, uh, I guess they're one and the same. So um, my my biggest warning is that you know, we're in the throes now of becoming a planet, a planet sized um, organism, if you like, a planet sized being. And um, that's really important. Um, because, um, you know, it's only by becoming a planet sized being that we are able to um, achieve 
homeostasis, uh, you know, achieve stability, um, sustainability. And, um, you know, we, we kind of are in a situation where we can only go forward or back. It's almost like we're in the birth canal. Like there's no going sideways. It's either forward or back. Uh, back would mean uh, return to being, uh, you know, a species, you know, like humans being a species like any other species on earth um, that, uh, that is subject once again to um to those darwinian pressures where you know most most children are are, are um uh, die die during uh, childbirth or in their first five years and um you know and, and we're basically in the mix right along with along with every other every other animal that is you know that is sort of struggling to get along um i mean the likelihood of us going back to that state seems very low to me but okay. you know that would be one route i guess um the other route is forward where, where we all learn, there's a big we, a big we that includes technology and that includes uh, the other species on earth um, and that includes the earth as a system um, that learns how to regulate itself, whether that's uh, economically, environmentally, politically, um, you know, and, and um, for that to happen, we have to pull together. Uh, you know, the, when when we are othering uh, each other, when we're when we're in this kind of uh, of, of polarized us versus them conflict that I mm -hmm. feel like we increasingly are in, um, we are not realizing that all of our interests have to be aligned uh, mm -hmm. in order for in order for that that um, that larger that larger thing to happen. I I use the example of of um, of unions and uh, the coal industry, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I I grew up like uh, with, you know, listening to Pete Seeger and like, you know, very, very pro-union and I still am. But, um, you know, if, if, uh, um, if the coal union is, uh, you know, is trying to say like, you know, we need to preserve, uh, you know, coal workers' jobs um, and, uh, you know, <laughs> and, and coal is actually not a part of, of, our, of our future, uh, those two things are, are, are directly in conflict. Uh, mm -hmm. And they're only in conflict because we haven't, uh, accepted that all of the workers in the coal union are a part of that big us who have to be taken care of. Right. Um, you know, so if we, if we were to, if we were to address those, those underlying problems of othering, then we kind of solve everything in one go. Now, I know that's a very optimistic, you know, that's a very optimistic wish. We're never going to be free of struggle. We're never going to be free of, of political misalignment, et cetera. But I feel like it's, it's becoming extreme uh, now in a way that, that really, uh, risks destabilizing our planetary future. Mm, wow. What I think, I mean, we can't end on a better statement there. I couldn't agree with you more. Um, you know, our level of seeing ourselves as separate from one another is such a toxic illusion that we live under. And I'm so grateful for this work you've done and how um, diligent you've been about making this case in a way that people can't argue with because there's data. So, who are we now? Go pick it up. Go order it. It is fascinating. Blaze, where can people find you if they want to learn more about you and your work? Um, thank you for asking. So, um, so yeah, the uh, Who Are We Now, you know, is available from Haddon Beard Press uh, or from Amazon or at your local bookstore. Um, uh, it's also available for free online uh, at whoarewenow.net. Wow, um, extra awesome. Yeah. yeah the, wow. yeah, I don't we, hear we, that very often. No. Uh, My we, cousin you know, sent me a really cool interactive um, guide that you have that I think yeah. makes everything really tangible. The the uh, the idea behind put, I mean, of course, we wanted to make sure that it was online so that there wasn't any barrier to access, uh, but also the data are, are all there, and you know, we we did we did a bunch of work to make it beautiful and interactive. So it's not just a PDF; it's like a it's a real uh, it's it's a real you know work in its own right. I think um, even that is so aligned with your message of us versus them and everybody having access. And I think that's really beautiful. Thank you. I mean, obviously I'm, I'm very privileged in not having to make a living as, sure. as an author since Absolutely. I have a, I have a day job. Um, but, um, but yeah, my hope is also that making it, making it uh, widely accessible like that will, um, uh, you reach know, we'll we'll also just masses. reach more people, right. Yeah. Including, including the physical book. Um, and, uh, uh, and I'm on, um, uh, I'm on Twitter, or I guess it's now called X, and uh, X. and on Instagram as well. Uh, so I can also be found that way. And we, we you know, we announce, we announce. Like I'm starting to do book talks and things, so they're all they're all announced on there.
Wonderful. And we'll add all of that to our show notes for you listeners. Definitely. If you would like to, I highly encourage, uh, learn more about Blaze and uh, their amazing work. Blaze, thank you so much for spending this time with us. You were so generous with your time and your knowledge and your information. So and I think you've really added um, so much to this podcast and for our listeners. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both so much for your, for your awesome questions and, and, for, oh. your, and for your interest. And for my deer in headlights. <laughs> Not at I, I was in awe i promise is, all right listeners so thank you <laughs> all right Blaze, care, thank listeners. you again um melissa bean i'll see you again next week see you next week will you girl. come back all actually right. i'll Bye. see you next week in california Oh, that's right. In person. Live and All in right. person. If you want to support us, we would so appreciate you sharing this podcast uh, with your friends and family. And as always, leave us a review anywhere you listen. Thanks, guys. Bye.